Today, I'm taking you on an all-access, behind-the-scenes tour of the IBM mainframe. We'll visit not only the factory where the mainframes are built and tested, but also get a rare view of their brutal validation procedures before we tour IBM's largest data center, all as I try to unravel what's inside a modern IBM mainframe, why they still exist, and whether I can fit one into my rental car. We'll look at just how powerful a max spec Z16 full load actually is and how it compares to the modern desktop and cloud machines, all right here today in Dave's Garage. We went to bed late in Times Square and got up early to greet the sun on our drive from Manhattan to Poughkeepsie. IBM had invited us to come and do a deep dive on the new Z16 mainframes, and the reality was that I hadn't even been in an IBM data center since the late 1980s. I knew there were still use cases for mainframes, but I wasn't entirely up to speed on the why part, and that's what I wanted to find out. What makes a mainframe relevant today? We arrived at our destination, a large monolithic IBM building number 705 on this massive, sprawling campus. Those of you who have been watching the channel for a while already know that I worked a long time at Microsoft, but what you may not know is that before that, I actually put myself through school in part by working summers and evenings at IBM. My then-girlfriend and now-wife Nicole also worked at the IBM data center during college, and her dad spent more than 30 years working for Big Blue. So in a way then, it was a bit of a homecoming for us. I wasn't quite sure what to expect upon arriving, but not only did they roll out the red carpet, our first meeting was with the people that I really wanted to talk to, the engineers. We sat down with Matthias, Diana, and Mike, each of whom had about 20 years working on their individual area of expertise in things like CPU caching and core design. I really got to nerd out with them and ask questions that the marketing folks likely would not have been able to answer, such as how when a CPU's L2 cache line is evicted, it can be handed off to another CPU that has idle cache space. And then all the aggregate L2 caches in the system can be combined into a virtual L3 cache that benefits all the CPUs. The biggest thing I noticed was the level of passion these people had and just how stoked they were to be talking about obscure things like cache line trivia. Now, I worked at Microsoft back in the 90s when everybody thought they were changing the world and getting rich at the same time, so of course they were excited back then. But the folks that I spoke with at IBM had the same level of enthusiasm and it's something I haven't seen firsthand in the industry in quite a while. And after an hour or so of peppering them with questions, I finally knew enough about the CPUs to lay my hands on one, so they brought me out a tray of new Z16 Telem CPUs to examine. Each module features two CPU dies, and each die contains eight cores for a total of 16 per chip. These are much larger cores than you would find on an x86 or ARM chip, and each core has its own private 32 megabytes of cache, which completely dwarfs the 64 to 96 kilobytes per core that you'd find on a typical server CPU. And with so much cash, you can see why the cores are so large, even using a modern Samsung 7 nanometer process. The Telem CPU's architecture allows it to share unused L2 cache as a pool that comprises an L3 cache, which means it has 256 megabytes of potential L3 cache per 8-core chip. That compares pretty favorably with, let's say, a Gen 3 Epic chip that only has about one eighth as much. Now, just how fast those cores run depends on the machine configuration. With water cooling, which is a requirement once you get past just a few CPUs, each CPU runs at its full 5.2 GHz. That's the base clock and the boost clock, and it doesn't change. They never declock or throttle this CPU, so even if they need to slow things down, they simply insert wait states rather than changing the frequency. A modern AMD or Intel server chip might be able to match that on a single core, but once the desktop chips engage all their cores, they generally fall back to the base clock, which can be as low as 2 GHz on some chips. This can amount to a huge advantage for the mainframe when it's a heavy workload. They even take it one step further by virtualizing spare L3 cache slots as an L4 cache pool that can be shared amongst the processors, even between drawers. The bitrate of this sharing goes down as the path between CPUs becomes more distant, but it's still significantly faster than falling back to the physical RAM. To sum up the cache then, there are 32 megabytes of private L2 cache per core, and there are 8 cores per die, and thus 256 megabytes of virtual L3 cache available to any core on that die. That L3 cache is also then virtualized into 2 gigabytes of L4 cache per CPU drawer, and potentially 8 gigabytes of cache across the entire system. A single mainframe can have several compute drawers, with each drawer really amounting to a CPU motherboard, power supply, and all the interconnects. IBM has moved to using standard 19-inch racks for their equipment, and so you'll find that this machine looks a lot like a 4U server. 
This is an air-cooled unit, which means it operates at 4.6 GHz, and you can have a maximum of a single compute drawer with four 16-core CPUs. Here you can see the front pusher fans in various stages of disassembly so that you can see partway through them, and some of the board here is cut away so you can see the thickness and uh, sturdiness of the motherboard as well. I decided to remove the heatsink so that I could see what I could see, but all that I could see was the top of the CPU itself. Fortunately, the one next to it had already been removed, and that allows us to see the socket and the pin grid array interface. You can see these are truly beefy units that require a lot of airflow, and that have heat pipes that run up so that the magic goo inside can boil off, and that convects heat up to the top of the unit where it is carried away by the airflow. Here you can see the thermal interface between the heatsink itself and the lid of the chip. They don't use thermal compound, but instead preform sheets of thermal transfer material. Let's have a look at a clear Z inside a clear rack so we can get an orientation for where everything goes and what makes up the mainframe itself. Here we have the compute drawers on top, below that, we see all the I.O. cages below that. Generally, you're going to buy a mainframe in one of four configurations, either the giant four cage monster with 200 and some cores, or a single frame mini monster with about 64 cores. And since everything is built on a 19 inch rack standard, they also supply rack mount versions with as little as 18U and as much as 42U requirements for space. Viewed from the front and with the fans removed for a better view, here's what you can see of the compute unit in the Clear Z16. And as we move down, we move on to all of the I.O. and power supply units that help support the system. Now, I'm not an engineer, but even to me, all the hardware kind of looks next level. Now, I guess that's what you wind up with when you take the attitude that reliability is worth the extra cost. Now, it's not that money is no object when building a mainframe, but you simply don't have the pressure to economize every penny out of the platform because there just aren't that many platforms. By adding more compute drawers, you can add CPUs up to a maximum of 256 cores and we'll look at a maximum spec Z16 shortly. But even when equipped with the maximum count of cores, they might not all be available. That's because in the mainframe world, they can over-provision cores so that if any fail or if an upgrade is needed in place later, spare cores are standing by as hot spares to take over the load without a hiccup. Each of these drawers is connected directly to each of the other drawers, so they don't have to share bandwidth over some common bus, and each can communicate continually at the maximum rate of the connection. That's also the speed at which one CPU can access the cache of another CPU in the L4 layer, and it looks to be 320 gigabytes per second. For comparison, a modern Xeon running memory at 3200 megatransfers per second of 64-bit RAM approaches about 25 gigabytes per second. And if I've got my numbers right, that means the drawer interconnect is about 10 times faster than a Xeon can talk to its main memory. If you disagree with my math, please let me know in the comments and as to why. Each CPU drawer can contain a maximum of 10 terabytes of memory for a total system capacity of 40 terabytes of RAM. Memory can be over-provisioned, meaning you might install 40 terabytes, but really only activate 30 terabytes of it. The remainder then can be activated as needed and the system can be upgraded without a reboot. Moving on from the CPU drawers for a moment, we encounter the I.O. drawer. Each CPU has a set of three 32 gigabyte per second Gen 4 by 16 PCI connections, each of which goes to a fanout. Each fanout then has two redundant paths to every I.O. device in the system at a full PCI Gen 3 by 16. With 12 fanouts per compute drawer, you can have a maximum of 12 I.O. drawers, and each I.O. drawer contains 16 PCI slots, as well as two slots per drawer for PCI switch cards. So in total, you're looking at a system that not only has 192 PCIe slots, each of these slots can also communicate at a full 16 gigabytes per second. It's a lot of I.O. Naturally, I knew what everybody's first question would be, so I asked whether you could just install 192 GPUs and do some serious Bitcoin mining. They seem to frown on that idea for a number of reasons, not the least of which is probably heat and power concerns. But rest assured, they would not make a system with 192 slots if somebody somewhere wasn't actively using them. But what do mainframe customers actually run for PCIe cards? Well, storage cards, of course, but also things like FICON, high-speed data transfer boards, cryptography assist boards, compression boards, AI boards, and so on. We've covered a lot of the hardware aspects, so now it's time to have a look at how the Z16s are actually assembled. And not unlike a bespoke automobile manufacturer, carts arrive here in the assembly area with numbers that correspond to customer orders and that include parts required at the next assembly station. And so, to begin an assembly process, the worker will pull the cart associated with their order before beginning. 
And here's some server frames, which look a lot like racks, but they call them frames, are on their way to the assembly area. And here on the racks, I believe we find completed sub-assemblies that are going off to test before being further installed into customer systems. As you can see, this area is quite expansive, and they've got a lot of machines under construction at any one time. Once the machines are far enough along in the assembly process that they require power, you'll see extensive power connections at each of the stations. And here's an example of a typical assembly station, this one fairly early in the process, so mostly focused on the mechanical construction like cage nuts and all the hardware needed to assemble and install the things we can currently see in the rack. It's fairly far along. As you can see, there's a ton of I.O. and a CPU cage it looks to be water-cooled as well. This lift station is cool in that not only can it lift the entire mainframe in order to make the lower bays more easily accessible to the assembler, but because we're on a raised floor, it can also drop the mainframe up to 18 inches to bring the upper bays down to a more reachable level. In another example of something that used to be in the I.O. drawer but is now actually on chip, the Z16 supports AI inferencing directly on the CPU die. It's designed to support high-speed, real-time inferencing at large scales. It runs at more than six teraflops all by itself, and it's then shared by the cores on a single chip. Having AI inferencing available in an on-chip manner ensures higher performance than could be done across the PCI bus, and it achieves levels of performance that enable some stringent service level agreements. For example, if you're a credit card processor, without something like this, you simply would not be able to do true AI-based fraud analysis on every single transaction. But with the Z16, you can. It's one thing for ChatGPT to snooze for a few seconds, but certain transactions need to be smart and fast. The introduction of AI right onto the CPU die is just the latest in a trend of moving important accelerators onto the chip. That's why the Z16 has built-in acceleration for encryption and compression as well. At some point, those features became so important that a specific hardware accelerator made more sense than trying to optimize the general purpose CPU for the same task or having the accelerator off on the bus. IBM subjects its designs as well as individual systems to some impressive testing. They do extensive vibration and shock testing wherein they record the G-loads experienced on an extended delivery ride. Then they play back that G-load information condensed for time on a hydraulic shock table. Let's have a look at some of the more extreme physical testing. Okay, to be honest, I think something went wrong with the hold downs on that last one. At least I hope they don't really tip them over like that very often. The Z16 does something unique with memory as well. I assume many of you will be familiar with RAID, which stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. Well, the Z16 does RAIM, where M is for memory. It effectively stripes data across RAM in RAID 10 fashion, meaning that if your system is hit by a cosmic ray that flips bits in a way that ECC memory alone could never hope to fix, nothing is impacted. Now, if like me, you're kind of a warm guy anyway, let me assure you that throwing on a plasticky lab coat in a hot lab is the last thing you want to do, but I, I'm doing it for you and I got the footage that you need to see. So on one side of the robotic station sits trays of dims, and they could all be different or they could all be the same, I don't know, but what's important is that the robot knows. And so when it needs one, it reaches over, grabs one of the memory modules, takes it over to a scanner, which presumably both verifies that it's the right one and records where it's going. The module is then aligned much more precisely than a human could do, and it is slowly inserted. Once it gets confirmation that it is in fact in now, it can retract and go on to the next one. I'm told the automation of this particular task pretty much eliminates errors and mistakes, and it allows one operator to run four stations that run at approximately the same speed as a human. And speaking of cosmic rays, IBM actually tests for that too. 
We got to check out the actual system that they haul down to the local university hospital periodically and where they then blast it with intense radiation to simulate an eternity of cosmic background radiation. Doing so helps protect the system against natural freak events such as solar flares as well. But that's not all they test for. According to the engineers, they also test the system while overvolting it, while undervolting it, with the clock rate set both too high and then too low. They cool the machine down to near freezing and then bake it at 104 Fahrenheit in a giant thermal chamber to ensure that the cooling system can still cope with it. The fans might scream at 104, but the system will still run on its own. Let's have a look at how the Z16 uses water cooling to help achieve it. All of the higher spec mainframes run a water cooling loop in a closed circuit. The lines enter at the back and then join a log style manifold which has both an inlet and a return to each CPU socket. The RAM section is still air cooled in all of the setups. You can hot swap a CPU by simply removing the mounting bracket and then popping the CPU chiller off the top of the CPU itself. You then swap the CPU, put the bracket back, and there's no need to drain any fluids from the system. IBM makes extensive use of the Hudson River for cooling. This and multiple other valve stations allow that cooling water to reach important equipment like electrical, air conditioning, and so on. With older models, you could direct water-to-water -water intercool, but it's not needed with the Z16. Once a system is assembled and before it can enter test, it needs to be filled, and that's done here at the filling station, which provides deionized water. And here in the center of this three-frame stack, you can see the cooling reservoir box, the cooling lines going to the dead center of the machine, and the rest of the cabling that you might suspect to be water cooling is actually PCI bus interconnects. And here's where I discovered they were relying on an old friend, something I'd worked on. Well, not the embedded version, but Windows XP at least. That's right, their fill station still runs Windows XP. I guess when you absolutely, positively need your fill station to work every time, you only rely on the very best. Now at this point, here's the dilemma I was facing, even though I now knew a lot more about the systems. It still seemed to me that if you gave me pretty much any task that a mainframe was designed to do, I was confident that I could think of a way to do it with a rack full of comparatively cheap PCs and SSDs. After all, for any problem, you can just throw more boxes at the distributed PC version, and they're cheap. And that's all true for the most basic cloud tasks, like web serving. In reality, however, not everything is as easily distributed as web serving. There still exist large, uncharted databases that cannot be effectively distributed, for example. In fact, there are numerous cases where the mainframe still shines as the best solution. And you can find those cases concentrated rather heavily in the financial sector. If you've ever withdrawn cash from an ATM, odds are it was a mainframe behind the scenes. If you've checked your account balances from your phone, that's a mainframe. If you bought a laptop at the Apple Store or bought an airline ticket or booked a hotel room, it happened on a mainframe somewhere. And if you filed your federal taxes or had a package delivered by UPS or FedEx, again, it's a mainframe. So why do these tasks need a mainframe? In part, it's the performance that vertical integration can deliver. When you swipe your credit card at the gas pump, you don't want to wait 45 seconds for an approval. You want it to happen right now, every time. And it's the same for most retail purchases. Global commerce runs on the backs of mainframes, and when you're running global commerce, it better work reliably the first time every time. As but one example, let's take a quick look at how seriously they take something as simple as networking by looking at how they manage fiber at the data center. IBM is serious about fiber. I don't think I saw a single twisted pair cable in the place. Everything is almost literally fiber. And it all goes to a central patch room that we'll see in a moment. This box can multiplex a dozen fiber optic signals onto a single output by merging them through color filters and then multiplexing them all onto the same glass line. They also have a 100 kilometer fiber loop in order to physically distance two machines from one another and test things with forced latency so that replication and so on can be tested over true distances while you're in the same room. And the fiber just goes on and on here. It's rack wall after rack wall after rack wall of things connected with fiber. And somehow they keep track of it all. Whether it makes it harder or easier, I'm not sure, but there are no direct connections here in the data center. Every cable runs back to a patch room before it comes back out of the patch room to its final destination. Now, if you thought that component stereo that you wired up back in the 80s was really complex, this should give you an idea of what actual complexity looks like. Like I said, somehow they track every cable and every connection, and they can find it when they need it. Whereas at home, I can barely keep track of three VLANs and I'm using color coding. And when you use that much fiber, how do you buy it? Well, by the forklift pallet, it looks like. And here in the test lab is an old buzzard waiting for an IBM machine to die. 
Looks like he's growing old in the process. Let's have a final look then at why the mainframe is still relevant and where it holds the upper hand over more pedestrian data center systems. First, there's unparalleled reliability. Mainframes, especially models like the IBM Z16, are renowned for their reliability. They can achieve up to seven nines of availability. In practical terms, this means just milliseconds of downtime annually. Such reliability is crucial for mission-critical applications where even a brief outage can have significant consequences. Thanks to the speed of fiber, mainframes can be ganged into clusters even across large distances, so if one fails, the entire workload could be shifted to alternate systems locally or to the other side of the planet. They support advanced redundancy and recovery. Mainframes are designed with extensive built-in redundancies. From power supplies to CPUs, if one component fails, the system can automatically switch to a backup without any downtime. This design also allows for hot swapping, where critical components, such as CPUs and memory, can be replaced without shutting down the system. They feature efficient data handling. Mainframes use a unique channel-based I.O. system, unlike the bus-based systems in most PCs, and this channel-based design allows for higher throughput. Unlike the bus-based systems in PCs, this channel-based design allows for higher throughput and more reliable I.O. operations. It's akin to having dedicated highways for data, ensuring smooth and efficient traffic flow. Imagine that everywhere you wanted to drive, there was a fresh paved road with no other traffic on it, and then contrast that with sitting on a bus in a traffic jam. Logical partitioning. IBM has been doing virtualization since long before virtualization was cool, going back to the 1960s. This functionality allows a mainframe to be divided up into multiple virtual systems, each one running its own operating system. That means if one partition encounters an issue, it won't necessarily affect the others, ensuring continuous operation. Not only can you partition the system into numerous VMs, but those VMs can also contain other hypervisors. You can have a mix of virtualization, bare metal, and multiple operating systems and environments all running side by side at once, completely isolated from one another, with each believing that it has complete control of the system. Now, while the upfront cost of a mainframe can be high, the long-term benefits often do justify that investment. Mainframes consolidate workloads, meaning that instead of managing hundreds of servers, a business might only need to manage one mainframe. This consolidation leads to savings in administration, energy consumption, and even software licensing in many cases. It might not be sexy, but conserving floor space in the data center can translate into serious savings over time. Mainframes come equipped with robust security features, ensuring that data remains protected and that system disruptions due to security breaches are minimized. Only about one-tenth of one percent of mainframe customers ever experience a breach, a number that can be significantly higher on commodity systems. Mainframes like the Z16 can even encrypt main memory, and they do it with quantum-safe algorithms, so that even if you took a snapshot of a memory page today, a quantum computer still won't be able to crack it 50 years from now. In conclusion then, even in an age of rapid technological advancement, mainframes have retained their relevance. Their unmatched reliability, combined with their ability to efficiently handle vast amounts of data and offer cost savings in the long run, ensures they remain a cornerstone in the IT infrastructure of many large organizations. I'd like to thank IBM for hosting us and to thank you for joining me on our tour today. If you found it to be any combination of interesting or informative, I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to the channel. And please make sure to turn on all notifications for your subscription so you don't miss my episodes even with my sometimes sporadic release schedule. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.